steel deal. The experts are retarded, and things are only going to get worse. With that bait for the hook, permit me to expand a little further upon that observation. In recent years, a lot of focus has been put onto DEI initiatives, that is, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. These are things that have been put in place by institutions and governments, and this was as a means of broadening the horizons of these institutions by increasing amounts of diversity. Usually this is along the lines of ethnic diversity, although it can sometimes include things such as religion, and of course sexuality and so-called gender identity. And this was done to create a more equitable and inclusive workplace. Now, as this has gone on, more and more people have realized that this basically not only amounts to active discrimination against white males, with an honorary mention for East Asian males as well, but has also resulted in a seeming lowering of standards across the board in any place that these policies are instituted, and people who have been pointing out these lowering of standards are quite right to do so since a lot of these lower entrance criteria on these frequently high-value, high-skilled jobs, it's actually starting to endanger people's lives. You're seeing this with increasing coverage of things such as fire services looking to get more black female applicants through their process, and then these people being unable to actually perform the job. We've seen similar scandals erupting over airline travel, for example, not only in the form of pilots, but also in the engineers who keep the things in the air. And what I'd like to call attention to today, ladies and gentlemen, is the step before the DEI. It's all well and good pointing at the DEI and saying these people are incapable or incompetent and they should not have been given these jobs. Well, why did a bunch of these people end up with these jobs? especially in fields such as engineering or medicine, careers that actually require you to have a high degree of education, or at the very least, proof of a high degree of education. Well, there is actually where the problem begins. You can very frequently, around and about the place online, find pages such as this, which talks about university majors, this is university courses, and the average IQs of people on those courses. And you very frequently find the same numbers over and over and over again. And you look at a lot of these numbers and you think, well, yeah, that looks about right. A lot of them are in the 120s or the low 130s, particularly the ones that are intellectually taxing, such as physics and astronomy, mathematics, engineering, philosophy, physical sciences, and even things that you might think to be a little more soft, like certain areas of the humanities or arts still requiring somewhere in the 120s. Well, this looks about right, surely. Even I myself have said, historically speaking, you'd be hard-pressed to find people in universities, any university on any course, with an IQ of below 115. This is just, historically speaking, true. The key word there being, historically. Not wanting to date myself too much here, but this was true when I was in attendance at university. And this was still broadly true some numbers of years later when I returned to the academy and had to occasionally deal with teaching people. But even in that time period, I noticed that there was a definite drop-off in student quality. Some part of me wanted to, of course, hand wave this and say, well, this is just because I'm older and wiser now. I know more now than I did when I was 20-something. Perhaps I'm just judging the youth too harshly. Well, the numbers that you've been looking at on your screen for a while now, I've attempted to track down where they come from, and a lot of them are just circular citation, but eventually leads back to the Educational Testing Service, specifically the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, 1979. And this survey seems to be referenced a number of times across a variety of studies, such as this one, Scholastic Assessment, or G, the relationship between the Scholastic Assessment Test and General Cognitive Ability. Most importantly at this point is a lot of these numbers that you're seeing, these 120-something IQ assertions, which are still being used in the current day, are citing things from 1979. Now, I'm sure the eagle-eyed out of you, ladies and gentlemen, have already noticed, we are no longer in 1979. In fact, we have not been in 1979 for a good few decades. 
So the obvious question to ask is, is this still true? Do these numbers still hold? Well, unsurprisingly, the answer is no. There was a meta-analysis published in March 2024 by Utel et al. Meta-analysis, on average, undergraduate students' intelligence is merely average. As the background notes, according to widespread belief, the average IQ of university students is 115 to 130 IQ points. That is, substantially higher than the average IQ of the general population, median 100, standard deviation 15. We traced the origin of this belief to obsolete intelligence data collected in the 1940s and 1950s, when university education was the privilege of a few. Examination of more recent IQ data indicate that IQ of university students and university graduates dropped to the average of the general population. The decline in students' IQ is a necessary consequence of increasing educational attainment over the last 80 years. Today, graduating from university is more common than completing high school in the 1940s. So they go through a bunch of universities and their entrance criteria and the IQ tests that were administered. Some of them they find to be okay and others they find to be a lot more questionable in their methodology, as is frequently the case with older IQ tests. And the results of their findings are that today's average undergraduate IQ is only about 102. But they do of course note that this varies substantially across universities and is correlated with the selectivity of universities. That is to say that very highly selective universities tend to have higher average IQs, whereas universities that let in basically anyone tend to be lower in average IQ, perhaps surprising no one. What is of course more interesting is taking tables such as this, looking at average IQ of probable undergraduates by projecting them from SAT attainment, done in 2022, and comparing that to the same method of yesteryear, and noting the same subjects. So for instance, in the old data, physics and astronomy, there's not an exact correlate in the modern for that one, but mathematical sciences, the old method, you would expect people to have an average IQ of about 130 in decades past, whereas in the 2022 model, using a similar projection, you would expect an average IQ of about 116. In other words, a modern graduate of mathematical sciences is on average 14 IQ points lower than a mathematical graduate from the 1970s. That is, of course, assuming that mathematical sciences and mathematics and statistics could be one-to-one -one correlated, as they are defined in both of these studies. The next down the list, philosophers of yesteryear you would expect to be having an average IQ of about 129, comparing that to a philosophy and religious studies major of today, or 2022, whom you would expect to have an average IQ of about 108, 21 IQ points lower than their forebears. Next down the list, material engineering. There's not an exact corollary in the modern day, but if we just put it as engineering in the umbrella sense, material engineering in the past, 129, engineering in 2022, 109, 20 IQ points lower than it would have been in decades past. If you wanted to put material engineering under engineering technologies instead, then it opens up even wider, because engineering technologies is an average of about 104. From a historical average of 129 to a modern average of 104. The economics of yesteryear, again, there doesn't seem to be a direct corollary into the modern day. There seems to be similar problems with chemical engineering and mechanical engineering, but since we referenced the modern engineering, we can just put them all under the same umbrella anyway. There's still a significant difference. Physical sciences in the list actually is on both of these tables. So the physical scientists of yesteryear would have had an average of 125 IQ, a physical scientist of the modern era, 113. Banking and finance is also perhaps a little too specific to transpose over to the modern one. And then the final one, other humanities and art. Well, if you just tied the 124 of history to the broadest umbrella of the modern era, say liberal arts and sciences, general studies and humanities, you're looking at historically 124 to about 110, 111 in the modern era. 
Now, think about everything that we've just discussed. The previous study noting that the average graduate's intelligence is about average. Look at the IQ attainment of the decades past compared to the IQ attainment of modern era. You're basically looking at a student now being a minimum of a standard deviation dumber than someone who took the same course, the same subject, 20 to 40 years ago. This is an astounding drop in mental ability. An absolute precipitous decline in standards. So how and why did this happen? Well, I've addressed this historically, but I think it also bears repeating again. Historically speaking, higher education was for the elite. It was for the people who were intelligent. It was for the best. It was for the brightest. And as a result of that, in the UK at least, it was state-funded. But as a result of that, you had to be brilliant. Or well-connected and rich enough to bribe your way in. But even if that was the case, you still had to at least have something going on upstairs to be able to get in and stay in those institutions. And what we saw in the end of the 90s, but particularly into the early to mid-2000s, was this mass opening up of higher education, specifically under the Blair government, but it was continued under the conservative governments that followed. This mass opening of the gates to this higher education. Combined, of course, with student loans, rather than grants. This opening of education and turning these higher education institutes effectively into these profit-driven diploma mills resulted in the creation of these bargain basement tier qualifications. Despite the oft-cited joke about people getting a liberal arts degree in underwater basket weaving, if there was the demand for such a course, if there were enough people with enough money saying, we want to learn how to weave baskets underwater, you can be damn sure one of these universities would rapidly develop a course for underwater basket weaving so they could take your money. Higher education was no longer reserved for the brilliant. It was no longer the preserve of the best and the brightest. Instead, it was for everyone. The problem with that is, everyone is average. University went from being the 115 plus, the top 15% of the population at best, to being for the 68%, the people in the middle of the bell curve, and also the people at the higher end, but mostly the people in the middle. The reason being, that's where 68% of the population is, that's 68% of the population's money that you can get while handing out these worthless pieces of gilt paper. So how and why does this apply to the modern DEI problems? Well, the people who get these DEI jobs, they need these pieces of paper. They can only get them at these so-called higher education institutes. These higher education institutes used to have some sort of gatekeeping. They used to require you to actually be smart, to actually be brilliant, or at the very least, to have a body of work, even if it couldn't be directly quantified intellectually, a body of work that could speak for itself. And that could also be enough to gain you access to these institutions. The point is, these pieces of paper, these qualifications, used to be gatekept to people who actually deserved them. These days, they are not. The DEI hires, the low achievers, can get these pieces of paper which is giving them access to these low qualification DEI jobs, which they are frankly not suitable for doing. So while it is all well and good to point at the DEI hires themselves, eyes and attention I think should really be on these low standard institutions that have been giving out to these pieces of paper for far less than they should be worth. After all, I think it's somewhat unfair to look at someone who has gone to these institutions with the promise that these pieces of paper, these classes that they sit through, is going to give them an education. It's going to actually make them more intelligent. It's going to make them better. I find it more difficult to fault the person who is trying to better themselves 
especially when so much of societal messaging is, you need to go here, you need to do this, you need this education because it will better you. Ultimately, that person is trying to do the right thing. They are trying to achieve as much as they can. The problem is the achievement itself, these days, is basically worthless. That is institute dependent, of course, which I think brings us nicely to the conclusion. So on the topic of higher education, if you are a younger person, I'm not putting this out to put you off going to university. Far from it. If that is what you want to do, by all means do so. However, you need to be very, very aware of what institute you are going to and what you are going to study at that institute. You have to be a lot more discerning in where you go, when you go, and how much you're going to be spending on that education. You need to be a lot more thorough in your vetting of these institutions, of these courses, and of the teachers of those courses. And that is ultimately a somewhat unfair burden on the young, because they don't know anything about these courses. They've never been on them, they've never been educated in them, you don't actually necessarily know what you're looking for, and yet to you, this duty falls. There are still absolutely high intelligence, high IQ, high worthiness universities and teachers out there. You just have to find them amongst this increasing number of, frankly, worthless institutions and worthless teachers. And worthless degrees, of course. So the silver lining there is decent education is still out there. It's just harder to find. Decent education is no longer the default of going to university, it is now the exception. To older people looking to return to university, say in your late 20s or your 30s because you're looking to perhaps change career, or maybe you're even a little bit older and you've just sort of hit a point in your career where some random bureaucrat in your place of work has said, in order for you to go further you need this piece of paper, even though you're actually qualified to go further you need this one specific piece of paper, or XYZ we can't sign the right forms etc. By all means, go back and improve yourself. As I've said, I'm never going to knock people for attempting to make themselves better. And I suppose the silver lining for you, coming back to university after 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to be infinitely easier. Not easier necessarily because you're any smarter or better educated, but easier because the standards are going to be a lot lower. You could have the same level of education as you did, say, 15 years ago, but you're going to go a lot further because they expect infinitely less from you. Whereas a degree course that when you were first in university you might have needed about a 120 IQ to pass, you could now get the same degree, despite only having an IQ of 105. It means that the degree that you get will be worth far less than the same degree if you got it 10, 15, or 20 years earlier, but if you don't particularly care for the quality of that piece of paper, it's more just having the piece of paper itself that matters, either because it's just proof that you did something, or it's necessary for some sort of career development, then by all means go for it. If it opens a new door for you despite being basically worthless, play the system at its own game, I guess. The overall conclusion, I suppose you could say, is higher education is selectively still worth it. Most of it is not, a very small amount of it is. Be very discerning in your choice of institution, and don't make the mistake that seems to be the one that is continuing in modern society of pedestalizing academia. It does not deserve it. It is broken, and if you want to fix the ever-increasing problems in society, fixing the academy and making sure that they actually have to have standards, that they actually have to gatekeep, so that people who are incompetent cannot get these pieces of paper, they can only be earned by people who are actually good, that will solve a lot more problems and a lot more upcoming problems than just pointing and laughing at DEI hires.